Welcome to Mastering the Next, a cutting-edge podcast that explores the future of graduate, online, and non-traditional education through the lens of AI and technology. I'm your host, Dr. Ray Lutsky, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Element 451. Join me every two weeks for discussions with some of the thought leaders shaping the future of graduate enrollment management through technology. Mastering the Next is a part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform that helps institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at Element 451.com. In this episode, I'm excited to welcome someone who truly knows what's next in higher education, New York Times bestselling author Jeff Salingo. In addition to his three notable books, including his most recent Who Gets In and Why, uh, Jeff is a regular contributor to The Atlantic, New York Times, Washington Post. He also publishes a great newsletter, Next and host the Future You podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. Jeff, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Jeff, in a recent episode of your podcast, you discuss various trends impacting PhD education today. From your perspective, what's next for PhD programs and how are these changes reshaping university education overall? Well, I think as we discussed in that great Future You podcast with Len Casuto, I think there are going to be you know, three big shifts in graduate education in in the coming years, especially around the PhD itself, right? The PhD has always been seen, at, had always been seen as a pathway to an academic job. We know there's not, not as many academic jobs as there used to be. And so we're going to see, number one, a lot more PhD programs produce graduates and be much more honest about this up front, which means they might shrink for other entities for other organizations, both in the corporate and nonprofit world. Second, I think that PhD programs are going to become more public facing in that they're going to be working a lot more with their local governments, local communities to solve problems, both locally, regionally, and statewide as well. I think that this idea of being insulated in the ivory tower and not doing research that necessarily benefited the local community, I think we're going to kind of move away from that, especially at more, more of the less selective PhD programs. And then third, and finally, I think what you're going to see is a lot more optionality in the PhD programs, whether that is more online, more hybrid, but also more exit ramps uh, short of the PhD, where students can work um, and continue to do research and then maybe go back and get their P finish their PhD later on, but get some sort of other type of credential, whether that is a master's degree or some other sort of, sort of credential. So I think those are the three big changes that I see coming along. That's interesting. And that kind of leads to the, the next question. And you talked about this a bit on your podcast, but would you share with us how you see the value of the PhD or whatever credential folks may get from that holding up in so-called non-academic jobs, which are really where a lot of folks end up? Yeah. And, and if you listen to the podcast, my co-host and I, Michael Horn, kind of disagreed on this. I actually think there is a need for PhDs in the job market. I think a lot of employers would like somebody who has deep knowledge within a certain subject, who has really thought about this, who has obviously done deep research on this. And so I think that there's actually a need for the PhD in the wider job market. Michael Horn, my co-host on Future is a little bit more skeptical of that, I think. But again, I think that if PhD programs are more public facing, actually prepare students for the job market outside of academia, I think that we can see them get hired in greater numbers. That makes sense. As someone with a PhD who isn't uh, a tenure track professor, I completely agree. So your last book came out a couple of years ago, an incredible book, Who Gets In and Why, during a very unusual time during the pandemic. And 
your long awaited next book is coming soon. Uh, and you've written a bit about this online, but could you give us a preview? Maybe tell us about some of the strategies you're envisioning for families involved in the college search process today. Yeah. I mean, my last book was about how to get in, right? And and how to get into more selective colleges. This next book is going to be much more, more broad, broader in terms of how we think about colleges and, and universities. You know, I think that a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go to a top 25 or top 30 or 40 or 50 universities, the same universities we talk about over and over again, or I can't get into one of those, or I can't afford it. Like, what are we looking for when we look more broadly at a set of colleges and, and universities? And I think that we sometimes return to the rankings and we tend to talk about the rankings over and over again because they give some semblance of order to a very large ecosystem that I think those of us who work in higher ed understand, but most of the general public doesn't understand. And so my hope for this next book is to help people understand what they're looking for in a college. What are the elements of a quote unquote good college beyond the top, say 30, 40, 50 universities? And that's what I hope to do that, as I say, widen the aperture on the lens of how we think about college. Cause right now it's pretty narrow. Yeah. And it, it makes a lot of sense that that is where a lot of folks start with the rankings and you've done in-depth research for all of your writing on undergraduate education. And I'm curious how that might parallel to the purpose of graduate school and it's evolving nature in the context of today's students and how they pick where they want to go. Yeah, I think that most students are really thinking at the undergraduate level about the job afterwards. I think that most of them actually don't think about grad school. But what's interesting to me is that in the financial model of parents and students, and as they think about cost of undergraduate education, most of the families are talking about graduate education in that context. What do I mean by that? So I'm meeting a lot of families and counselors in reporting this new book, who are making, I think, different decisions than they might have 10 or 15 years ago about how much to pay for an undergraduate education, largely because they want to save money for graduate school, because many of them know that, or some sort of graduate school, whether that is a full-fledged PhD or master's degree or something shorter than a master's degree, because they know that the job market is changing drastically. And as the job market changes drastically, people will need lifelong education, and that's going to cost money. And most parents and students do not want to be deep into debt coming out of undergraduate um, institutions. And so they're thinking much more logically, I think, than parents did and students did 10 or 15 years ago about this. That's really interesting. And it leads me to sort of a follow-up there. Um, How do you see the role of parents in students going to graduate school evolving. I mean, for most, I think, who have been through graduate school, their parents had very little involvement in the past of how they went to school, where they went to school, the means they paid for it. I assume based on what you said, that's going to be changing a lot. Uh, I believe it is. And and largely because I think we're starting to see this delayed adulthood, um, which I saw tracing back to my book a couple of times ago, uh, There is Life After College, where students were just delaying moving into their adulthood in their 30s. And so I think you're going to see parents a lot more involved. And we're seeing this in a lot of surveys and a lot of research. Parents much more involved in their kid's life post-college in terms of, of what they do, where they move, the jobs they do, and even graduate school. And so again, if again, if families are saying, we're going to try to save some money if we can, on on the undergraduate experience so that we can spend money on the graduate experience. Well, if they're going to do that, obviously families are going to be much more involved in the graduate school experience as much as the undergraduate experience. That's really interesting and a a different dynamic for sure. Yeah. I I think it's, I I don't think it's going to be as big. I don't think we're going to expect to see, you know, families touring graduate schools like we do at undergraduate levels. I, I'm not suggesting that at all, but I think we're going to start to see, the undergrad, you know, the cost of the undergraduate experience and how much we pay for that enter into this idea of, okay, what do we want to get out of the graduate experience? How much do we want to pay for that? I think you're going to see parents not as heavily involved as they are in the undergraduate experience, but somewhat involved in that experience. It's just fascinating to me. And it brings us to the topic of 
paying for school. And one of the ways to reduce the total cost is to do things online, which has become more and more popular over the last couple of years. And the leader in that space is Arizona State University, where you have done a lot of work with Michael Crow, the president of ASU, my alma mater. And ASU has taken a very successful approach to not just online undergraduate education, but online graduate education as well. And I'm wondering from your perspective, how are models like ASU's transforming graduate education, both in terms of access and affordability? Well, I think ASU's model, first of all, its mission is around serving not who we exclude, but who we include, right? Its mission is around research for the public interest. And its mission is about serving the needs of society in a much larger way that uh, as a public research comprehensive university. And this is not just a saying that they put somewhere and it sticks on a shelf. This is literally chiseled in stone at the entrance of, of ASU's campus in Tempe and main campus in Tempe. And, and one of the things that I've noted in the 10 years that I've been affiliated with ASU is that everybody knows its mission from the president all the way down to any employee on that campus. And they've been really consistent about that message. And so as a result, you see an institution that over the last 20 years has been scaled to this incredibly large university where they're not constrained by size because they serve both students in person, online, and in a hybrid format, where they try to help students succeed no matter where they're coming from, no matter their background, no matter their academic profile. And they do believe that you can produce quality at scale. Their research funding shows that. They're now a member of the American Association of Universities, right? The prominent AAU universities. They're starting a medical school with the Mayo Clinic, right? They're just, they're really now, I think, the model of what an American research university in the public interest should be. And unfortunately, they're one of, and they really need to be one of many in order to, I think, tackle the issues that are apparent in society today. And that's really, I mean, I, I feel that way based on my experience there. How do you do that? I, I mean, so many institutions have even questioned embracing asynchronous online education as a way to scale. How do you feel that other institutions, leaders at other institutions can come to that place to understand that serving the populace is part of their mission and they need to do that in a responsible way? How, how does a leader get there? Ray, if I knew the answer to that, I probably would be, I don't know, we would probably have 10 more ASUs now. You know, the ASU story has been well told many, many times over. And I think that there is this belief, it's kind of deep in our culture, it's really rooted in our culture, that that quality is only available at small sizes, right? And that, you know, if you look at the top 20, 25 universities, national universities in the US News and World Report rankings, for example, they're mostly private and they're mostly small even as you know, comprehensive universities. And I just think it's rooted in our culture that that's the case. And, and try to break that ideal is, is very difficult. Yeah, I was just hoping for a crystal ball magic uh, from you to tell us how that might work, but I understand. I, and I really does start, I, I guess the, the thing I could say is that it starts at the top, right? It starts with leadership. And, and I think that you know I've been kind of reading Michael Crow's background a lot over the last couple of months in preparation for a project that I'm working on with him. And I just think that this is, you know, the design of ASU is something he's been thinking about since graduate school at Syracuse University. In fact, even earlier in some ways, right? But that's really where the design of this idea of the new American university, as he calls it, really started. And, and I think that it kind of has to be in your bones as a leader. And when we have more leaders in higher ed like that, I think that we will see more replication of that model. It's a really interesting thought. You just brought something to, to my mind. I, having done a master's on campus at Syracuse and an online master's at Arizona State University, I would not see any difference in quality. In fact, the, the way the ASU program was designed was overflowing with quality. So it's interesting that that was part of the inspiration. 
Moving back to enrollment specifically, like undergraduate admissions, graduate school admission process can be daunting for many, certainly for parents, for students. Based on your insights, and kind of going back to what we talked about before, what differences do you see about how students can be successful in their approach to getting in to graduate school versus undergraduate? Yeah, I think that when it comes to graduate school, it's it's definitely a much more focused endeavor for, for students in terms of what they want to do compared to the undergraduate level where they might not even know what they want to um, major in. And so I think a lot of it is around finding you know mentors and people that can uh, provide you both advice as well as recommendations for graduate school. So I think that one of the things that I have found in my experience with working with students and interviewing students on campuses is that they tend to be a spectator to the sport of higher education and that sometimes they might get to senior year of college and not even know a faculty member as well enough to even ask for a recommendation for graduate school. So rather than think about graduate school when you're a first or second year student in college, I think what you really need to do is focus on you know, that undergraduate experience, getting the most out of it, whether that's in the classroom or outside the classroom, then you worry about graduate school after that. That's the way I would best prepare for it. But finding those mentors and making those connections with faculty members is critically important. And that makes a lot of sense. In, in some ways, it parallels what I remember reading in Who Gets In and Why, where you have prospective students, college-bound students who have various levels of sophistication, resources to, to really invest in that process. Do you see a parallel there between the students who are really thinking about their next steps, maybe even thinking about you know an MBA at one of those top 20 schools when they're freshman or a law degree. And then, you know, the folks who kind of decide, you know, their senior year, they look at the job market, there's something going on, they go, gosh, I better go to graduate school. And how do you see the parallels there between the, the stories you tell from the students you met in your last book to, to what might be happening today with graduate school? Yeah, I think that in my last book, I, as, at the undergraduate level, I talked about, you know, Applicants are either drivers or they're passengers in this process. And, and we see the same thing as in undergraduate. And I sometimes feel that students go to graduate school not quite knowing what they want to do. They are like passengers in that process. I always think graduate school is best taken when you have a reason, right? There's a purpose to that. I think graduate school needs to have a larger purpose. We've seen in the last you know, 20, 25 years, a large increase in student debt. And largely that's at the graduate level, because I think that students are chasing credentials rather than chasing purpose. And, and I really think that the students I see best served by graduate schools are chasing their purpose, right? This is what they want to do and they want to get further education for it. So Jeff, talking about working with folks in admissions offices and you have great experience working with folks in admissions offices. Your last book starts with a conversation going on uh, with counselors at a selective private university in the South. Y you know that attrition in these offices is becoming more and more acute. There's been stuff in the news about how potentially one in four of these enrollment management professionals are thinking of leaving the field or certainly leaving their jobs in the short term. Based on your experience, seeing how decisions are being made, how technology is changing the way enrollment works, what advice would you offer for a graduate admissions professional, graduate enrollment professional on how they can navigate this turbulent time, both for their job and for their professional career? Yeah, I mean, it's a big worry of mine, uh, Ray, because you know the generation of enrollment professionals, VPs for enrollment, deans of admissions, you know, at some of these colleges and universities are getting ready to retire and we need a new generation of leaders to replace them. And what you're seeing is that middle tier of leaders are leaving the profession altogether. And so what I think is that colleges need to make these jobs, especially at the beginning of the career, much better. And, and one way they could do that, I think many 
of these admissions officers are being overwhelmed now at some places by applications. They're being overwhelmed at other places by pressure on the bottom line. This is one where, place where I think AI can really help in terms of helping admissions officers do the tasks that um, are kind of repetitive in many ways and that don't necessarily need a human being. So for example, coding and reviewing transcripts, high school transcripts of students, you know, there's a lot of reading that's done in the application process, some of which really needs to be done by the human being, but not all of it. And that's where I think AI can help to free younger admissions folks up to be out on the road and talking to prospective students and recruiting, which is I the piece of the job that I think they love the most. And so that's where I think, you know, we talk a lot about AI as this kind of scary headline that's going to eat jobs and, and most of these jobs are going to go away. But I think at the higher ed level, it can really help with especially really save younger people in these careers so that one day they could take on these, these bigger jobs. And I think that that's, clearly coming with artificial intelligence. Since you brought it up, I do have to ask another question is what parts of the university do you see fundamentally changing through the introduction of artificial intelligence technology? Clearly, as you just mentioned, there will still be parts of the decision process for who gets in and why that rely on a human, but where do you see some more substantial changes happening in terms of the structure of American universities? I, I, I think that you're going to see a lot about the business around the business processes, right? Where you are going to see AI take over a lot of lower level functions in universities. And that's fine. I think this is a way to potentially bend the cost curve in higher ed to reduce uh, the workload. I think the, the biggest changes yet to come, and really, I don't think we know where to put our energy around this right now is what should colleges and universities be teaching, right? How should, you know, should every student have to take an AI course, for example? I think a lot of this discussion is going to be happening over the next couple of years, maybe even over the next couple of months to try to decide that. But that's where, you know, what, what are we preparing students for? A workforce that's clearly being reshaped by AI. And as a result, our curriculum needs to be reshaped as well. It's interesting. If you want to hear more of Jeff's thoughts about artificial intelligence and a variety of other topics, he'll be a keynote speaker at the 2024 Engage Summit, June 25th and 26th in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information at engage.element451.com. Use code Enrollify50 at checkout and you'll get $50 off your registration. Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and hope you'll join us again on the podcast soon. Mastering the Next Podcast is a part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Artis Cadu, JC Bonilla, Mallory Wilsey, Brendan Henkel, Brian Gross, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.